So with expectations like that, let's get into the song, shall we? The first song on our list today is one of those songs that you are simply not allowed to not like if you're a British rock fan. Even the most casual listener has heard of this song, to the extent where it even entered the very pinnacle of mainstream rock by popping up in the rock band game. Or was it Guitar Hero? I can't remember. It's Busker's Dream, and I cannot count the amount of times I've heard it played on various jukeboxes or in shady Midlands rock pubs from time to time. This is Band on the Run. Now, on this podcast, we've had a mixed bag so far when it comes to Paul's opening songs for his projects. But for the most successfully commercial and critically acclaimed album, you shouldn't be surprised that Band on the Run is a knockout. It sets the standard pretty damn high and promises to carry that across the entire album. Paul was seeking credibility with this Wings project, and after a start like the garbled mumbo and the disappointing false advertising of Big Barn Bed, I think many people were clamouring for the confident start that this song ultimately delivers. The song, in the best of Beatles fashions, is a glorious hodgepodge of three distinct and memorable segments. Again, with songs like Uncle Albert, Admiral Halsey, or Long Haired Lady, this is one of those songs where you can never imagine the songs sounding any other way at all, and it's a testament to McCartney's ability to create such dynamic and unconventional pop giants out of little more than these half snippets. I've seen this song be referred to in several publications, actually, as McCartney's own version of Happiness is a Warm Gun, the classic Lennon White album track, and whilst they both share a similar scattershot yet somehow cohesive nature, McCartney was already kind of doing stuff like this. The proper comparison would be Uncle Albert, if anything, which probably went further than Happiness is a Warm Gun ever did. But what Band on the Run achieved that neither of those two did was turn this format into an enjoyable, instantly memorable pop tune. Speaking about the meaning of the song, Paul said, It's about a million reasons, really. I can never lay them down. There's a million things. I don't like to analyse them all put together. Band on the run. Escaping. Freedom. Criminals. You name it, it's there. Now, I always just assumed, when they were talking about Band on the Run, Wings were talking about being on the run, either from the legacy that is the behemoth of the Beatles, or that they were simply running from their absolutely terrible reputation. Which I feel is a pretty reasonable, uh, kind of surface-level analysis of the song. Although, McCartney gives us another greener explanation as to where the song's roots may truly lie. We were being outlawed for pot, and our argument on Band on the Run was, don't put us on the wrong side, we're not criminals, we don't want to be. So, I just made up a story about people breaking out of prison. He continues, It was an era when everyone was like desperados, people getting busted, left, right and centre of things. So the spirit was like, we're all in this together. So, anything about desperados or on the run kind of united people against authority. And the song does just that. Paul puts himself and the band in the position of the people on the run, and just like any movie that's about a jailbreak, you instantly sympathise with those being imprisoned, not the guards or the law, despite how you may feel about the same type of people in reality. You are allowed to get behind the oppressed and root for their ultimate victory, which is freedom. And when your protagonist is Paul fucking McCartney, then you really don't have to try hard to root for him. The truth is, is that we all have a rebellious streak in us somewhere, and the quest for freedom is a primal one that we can all relate to. McCartney just so happens to be tapping into that rather sordid little emotion and tackle it in the safest and broadly attractive way possible. The kooky, adventurous tone of the song plays to the naughty little child inside all of us that secretly loves getting into trouble. It's not like these roots, though, are even that overt or anything. You don't have to know anything about the recording of the song. You can just still enjoy it as a simple jailbreak tune. Now, the idea of this song being a simple rebellious pro-marijuana song. It's not that shocking, really. Hi 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 had done something similar and earlier, but it was done as an obviously more overt, politically charged manner, and it had the result of the song being banned from the BBC Radio. So McCartney might just be trying to take a stab at doing another song on the subject that would slip past censors and truly subvert the establishment. That seems like a very McCartney thing to do. The first segment of this now classic song starts off very cautiously, almost coyly so, Paul 
as we know, was being lambasted for churning out mediocre soft rock. And I know this could simply just be him carrying on a similar sound, but there's this air that he's almost intentionally trying to trick us into thinking he was doing something similar, like he knew what was about to come. There is like a certain tension in the air as we begin our journey here. Perhaps Paul knew how good this album was going to be and doesn't want to spoil the surprise sooner than he needs to. The foreboding tone is all counterpointed by having a very mellow, almost reggae vibe. We're not diving right into this album. We're having a quick dip in the shallow edges on the beaches first. We have Linda doing her iconic little <laughs> band on the run keyboards. And things seem to be going steady, you know, no iceberg so far. And then the lyrics start, and right from the get-go and throughout this song, the lyrics are going to be there to tell a story. Even from the opening line of the song, we get the sense that this album is one that will follow and focus on the themes of freedom and escape. It even starts with, stuck inside these four walls, sent inside forever. They have lost hope, they never expect to see their loved ones again. The repetition of Mama is highlights the helplessness of our heroes, you know, they're literally crying out for their mothers. It's a nice little low point to start off just before we can kick things off. Because right around the corner we have the second part. Not only does it shift the tempo up a notch, or ten, but it also gets a whole lot grittier and grimier. You have that dominating rock riff that just shifts the whole mood and experience of the album. It's really one of those, this is gonna get good types of songs. I just can't understate how much the second part of this song actually gets me hyped up for the rest of the album. You really feel Paul, Denny and Linda are breaking their proverbial shackles and they're just making some damn music together. It's rousing and it's meant to, it's meant to, like all anthems should, inspire a sense of anger and rebellion in the listener. You really want to tear shit down and rise up to this kind of music. This part is also woefully short and I'll never forgive McCartney for not making it longer. But in defence and in true showman style he leaves you wanting more, which can never really be a bad thing. It has the air of Paul wanting to show the world, his critics, and maybe even former bandmates, from the get-go, just how heavy he can be. He's not going to take this same criticism again. Now, you know, don't get me wrong, this is hardly Master of Puppets or anything, but compared to When the Night and One More Kiss, two songs that I will use as reference points till the end of time, this is really an influx of hard rock. And significantly, this is without Henry McCullough. And hey, if Paul wants to prove how heavy he can be, I say let him, because when he last did that, we got Helter Skelter. The line that starts the second segment, If We Ever Get Out Of Here, was famously first uttered to Paul by George during the final days of Apple, where George must have felt like he was trapped in an endless series of meetings and contract signings. When Paul was talking to Clash Music in 2010, he said, It was all symbolic. If we ever get out of here, all I need is a pint a day. In the Beatles, we'd start off just as kids, really, who loved our music and wanted to earn a bob or two. So we could get a guitar and get a nice car. It was very ambitious at first, but then, you know, as we went on, it became business meetings and all that. So there was a feeling of, if we ever get out of here. And I did. When talking about the lyrics, Paul said, It's just a good flow of words. I don't like analysing stuff, but I do remember. It was meant to be about three months later, just lying in bed one night. It started off with, if I ever get out of here. That came from a remark George made at one of the Apple meetings. He was saying that we're all prisoners in some way. Some remark like that. If we ever get out of here. The prison bit. And I thought it would be a nice way to start an album. Those melancholic lyrics, along with the grinding weight of the harder rock sound, really emphasises the hopelessness of their confinement. And it's a necessary, even darker middle chapter to make the third part seem all the brighter and free. The third segment of the song ditches the fanged teeth and nerve and, and moves to the part of the song that everyone remembers. After that completely rousing, uplifting orchestral crescendo built and built, it dissipates, just leaving only a bright and joyous acoustic guitar with those wonderfully simple chords, and it just elicits that pure feeling of escaping and entering, being birthed into a whole new world, and it does so effortlessly. The weight of the earth that existed before this album is now dead. Long live Paul. His Ming dynasty has truly been ushered in. I would challenge anyone to be feeling anything but the best of emotions when this part of the song starts playing. For a song that is it literally ushering in a, a new world of music, a new soundscape that is Band on the Run, this acts as a perfect metaphorical intro. We, along with Paul, have broken free and we are now ready to receive the songs he has prepared for us in a whole new way. I would be lying out of my two front teeth if I said I didn't obviously like this song in the way that it obviously applies to me when you hear the lyrics uh, Sailor Sam. Sailor Sam was actually my original planned name for this show in the early days when I was uh, planning the podcast. It was shot down by close advisors very quickly. 
The song also holds a special place in my heart because, okay, and this is going to sound horrifically lame, but to any people out there who would like to play an instrument more and would like to be better at an instrument but either knowingly don't put in the time or just simply can't find the time or you don't have anywhere to practice and you know you'd be good if you could put your 10,000 hours in, you might be able to relate. I actually played this song with two dear friends of mine who, you know, musically I couldn't respect more. Shouts to Ryan and John out there. And when you're like me and you have friends like this who are by no means Paul McCartney fans, to have them then like learn the song and play it with you really quickly and on the spot and then play it through a couple of times, you know, it's just like one of those wonderful memories. You know, it really it really meant something at the time and it has a special place in my in my memory. God, I sound lame. <laughs> Moving on. Band on the Run is a song that is rather similar to the film The, the Shawshank Redemption. If someone told you that it was their favourite, you would think them a little unimaginative and obvious, but you know deep down that certain things are hugely popular and classic for the pure and simple fact that they are great. It is the perfect opener for McCartney's return to form. It contains a classic chorus, an inventive and classic array of soundscapes, all masterfully interwoven, stellar production, and a catchy vibe that can range from a pub sing-along to a stadium full of fans chanting along. The fact is, that this is band on the run, not man on the run, and it signals that this song, nay this album, is to be best listened to in the company of others, friends, family, whoever. I always find it difficult to talk about this next song objectively, as it is the song on the album that I know people will always like more than me, nay absolutely love far more than I do, and that almost fires me up to review it more negatively, so I have to remain composed and professional about this. This is Jet. Jets. I thought the major was a lady. So for a jet, 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 Now, I do not dislike this track in any way, shape, or form. It is obviously a defining wings track that took them out of the middle tier and got them a bit of traction. And it's a great track to do that, and it's great that it did that. I guess I just feel it's a bit more iconic than it should. And I know that I wasn't alive back then or anything, and I wasn't able to experience the music scene firsthand. But for me, the song has always just been one of many excellent tracks on Band on the Run. Amongst such an eclectic album of styles, energies, and rhythms, the mass appeal stadium rocker Gigantis feels just a bit safe by comparison, really. However, Jet can be seen to be what Red Rose Speedway ultimately was meant to be about in the first place. Wings had that harder, rockier edge on so many of their unreleased tracks, and McCartney was finally tapping into that. And bam, the moment he does, the moment he pulls his finger out and gets his act together, he is catapulted back into the limelight. We all know that Denny Saul and Henry McCullough wanted Wings to have this hard rock sound in the first place, and left because they were upset with the way that Red Rose Speedway ultimately sounded, notably for not including sounds like that. So, is this Paul finally listening to them, or is he creating a heavier badass rock album, you know, to spite them, to show them that he really is edgy, and he can, more importantly, do it without them? It starts with a full, slow burn of a builder. One of the things that is immediately apparent about the way that it's set up is that Paul has obviously taken writing cues from when he was writing a Bond theme, obviously with Live and Let Die, as it has the same sort of orchestral magnificence and scale to it. The arrangements from the classical musicians induce feelings of nobility and regality. It's a sound that no is normally reserved for great war heroes or, or heads of state, and there's a certain subliminal sense that he's truly saying, I know I was gone, but I'm back, I'm great and on form. Now, we've been introduced to the whole concept and the world of Band on the Run, and now, bam, there's this brass titan in its wake. It has that Uncle Albert Britannica pride mood that we talked about before, which always goes down well with me, almost like Macker is trying to confidently herald a second British invasion out there into the world, but without his bandmates, he's doing it himself. There's also those uh, coy little drums that pitter-patter in the background, and that those great slicing single guitar notes that cut right through the mix with a, a real rocking audacity, as well as the half-heard McCartney mutterings in the background, all working together with these brass arrangements, working towards hinting at another major tectonic shift. This intro hints that something big is coming. 
Then, with a swift roll across the drum kit, the energy explodes as we segue into the main groove and pump that the song is known for. And what's immediately noticeable about this track is that the normally melodic Paul swaps things up and gives us more of a dirty drone than what we're used to. Paul's uncharacteristically dense and thick bass line is almost defiant of his style and drives the beat of the song perfectly. It's almost like a 70s pop grunge sound, maintaining that single root note throughout the entire song's length, never losing its potency nor edge. I never thought you could headbang to a pop song in this way, but you nearly do. It signals again that he's experimenting with that heavier tone and doing interesting things with it. The fact that he is experimenting shows that we should not attempt to expect what is going to come on this album. The drums genuinely evoke a certain gallop and momentum to them as they pass through the song. There's a definite heft and thump to them, and they do nothing light or fancy on the track. You know, this is Paul's drum style, and there are these constant little fills and ripples, and there's, there's always something going on, and it just screams the almost inexhaustible energy that McCartney has, and that this track wants to translate to the audience. The excessively brash and in-your-face symbols only add to this splendour on display. And there's no doubt in my mind that one of the strengths of this track is its rhythm and the fact that the rhythm was controlled solely because McCartney played both bass and drums. And it means he can channel his original idea a lot more easily onto vinyl, which is my exact argument about just having McCartney have session musicians rather than a band at all. Paul clearly has a very specific idea in his mind for this song and, you know, by not having any more middlemen or mediators than he needed in its creation, it results in a, a wholly McCartney track. But conversely, you cannot imagine anyone else performing it besides Wings. When talking about the song, Linda McCartney said, he wanted, to be v he wanted that one to be totally mad. Paul's had a lot of practice in the studio. He's done some trippy things. Every now and then, he remembers just how much he loves it. Linda herself actually delivers a wonderfully charming little keyboard solo that typified the Wings sound during this era. And whilst, yes, it does do the whole follow the main melody thing, as so many bad solos do. The fact that it's just so highly pitched and techno distorted that it has the shadow of semblance of creativity. You can feel right through your bones uh, that despite that Wings claim to never sit around writing singles, that this was definitely written as such, especially when it comes to the chorus. You know, this is a single for an album. I mean, come on, they knew people were going to love this. It's just full of this simple confidence that typifies the entirety of Band on the Run. There are no bells or frills, just JET, G-E-T. It's simple and to the point, which is its strength. It's just like RAM. It's one of those great monosyllabic power punches which ever so easily translates its catchy euphoria to the audience. The fact that a jet is a big and powerful machine also fits in very nicely with this idea. We are also very boldly introduced to it rather early in the song, in a similar vein to Get On The Right Thing, which is never a bad thing, where it gives you a titillating tease by giving you a, a smaller registered delivery of the powerhouse chorus that is to come. And as we know, Paul has never had a problem writing a chorus ever. But when we hear it the second time, it comes back all the bigger and all the more electric. But what exactly is Jet? Well, folks, we have to have a little bit of a confession time here on Paul or Nothing. Now, I don't know how many years I've known this song, at least 15 plus by the recording of this podcast and for all that time I have not known the proper genesis behind this song I don't know where I got this information so many people look at me like I'm I'm so weird when I when I mention this to them because I've always been under the impression that and please write in if, if you thought or were told something similar that Jet was a racehorse that Paul either knew heard of or owned there's that line with the wind in your hair of a thousand laces I always thought this was with the wind in your hair of a thousand races, which kind of only went to cement this, this misnomer in my head. But it turns out, after all that, that Jet is more or less a sequel to Martha, My Dear, uh, a song which was based on Paul's Dulux sheepdog. When talking about Jet to Paul Gambaccini in Paul McCartney in his own words, Paul said, We've got a little Labrador puppy who's a runt, the runt of the litter. We bought her alongside a row shop in a little pet shop out in the country one day. She was a bit of a wild dog, and she'd go out on the town for the evening, like Lady in the Tramp. She must have met up with some big black Labrador or something. She came back one day pregnant. She proceeded to walk in the garage and have this litter. Seven little black puppies. Perfect little black Labradors. What we do if either of our dogs have a litter, we try to keep them for the puppy stage. So we get the best bit of them. And then, when they get a bit unmanageable, we ask people if they want to have a puppy. So Jet was one of the puppies. We gave them all names. As we have seen over the last few albums, Paul rather uniquely can write odes to animals. Very much in the same way that he can write odes to friendship or to even love. 
What's more interesting though is just, you know that so clearly he just looked around one day or the thought of this dog just popped into his head and he went, you know what, I'll just turn it into a song, I can. You know he can. This is another testament to Paul's ability to turn anything mildly involved in his life into song. Now, I can't just ignore the fact that Henry McCullough earlier mentioned the idea of getting on a jet and going off to Lagos. And without being too analytical of the phrase, jet fits in perfectly with the album's themes of escapism, as it was indeed a jet that allowed Paul and the two remaining bandmates to make their escape to Lagos. The fact that Jet flies away also fits in nicely with the next song, Bluebird, which also flies as well. We will see later in 1985, the words of Jet were mostly chosen to fit the melody rather than for their meaning. The reference to the Lady Suffragette was a motif that appealed to McCartney without having really any wider significance or context. Uh, in the Paul Gambaccini book again, Paul was saying, I make up so much stuff, it means something to me when I do it, and it means something to the record buyer. But if I'm asked to analyse, I really can't explain what it is. Suffragette was crazy enough to work, it sounded silly, so I liked it. I know this kind of takes away some of the mysticism of Paul McCartney's songwriting, but the reality is there is a certain way to write a pop song, and not everything needs to come from some deep place or meaning, does it? He's been doing this for 15 years now, and knows, even subconsciously, that there are certain pieces that fit into certain places. Paul mentioned this when he discusses... Paul mentioned this in an another interview where he was discussing the instincts he has ascertained over the years of songwriting. However, one of the overall effects of this nonsensical way of writing songs is one of a kind of pure surrealism. If you're totally taking out the context of the words and you're just saying, saying things to sound nice, it really does become quite trippy. You know, we have this weird and strange collection of sergeant majors, suffragettes, lonely places on the moon. It's almost like subversively strange. And I know for a fact that this oddness slips past the attentions of its larger casual audience, who just take it for granted that this is what the lyrics are. Paul McCartney initially wanted no singles to be taken from Band on the Run at all. Uh, I have no idea why. However, radio personality Al Corey persuaded him that Jet would work well. The companies here in America, worldwide, would like a single on the album. It makes more sense merchandising-wise, but sometimes I just have to remember that it isn't a record store I'm running. This is supposed to be some kind of art. And if it doesn't fit in, it doesn't fit in. I don't know, Paul, are you that dedicated to the whole we don't sit around writing singles thing? You know how music works in the early 1970s, don't you? Like, you make the art and the album's done and they get to merchandise it how they want. You, you are right, you don't run it. At its original length of over four minutes, Jet was far too long to be played on the radio, so McCartney begrudgingly allowed Capitol Records to create an edit. This was issued as a mono promotional single with four sections removed, bringing the total length to two minutes 49. Jet was issued in the US on the 20th of January 1974, with Mamunia as its B-side. However, this was withdrawn after three weeks on sale, and was replaced on the 18th of Feb by a new edition of Let Me Roll It. Jet reached number one in the US, but only got to number seven in the UK, and was certified gold on the 1st of April 1974. So, you know, Jet is always going to be forever associated as the song that saved Paul McCartney. Now, should it be? That's the question, and I'm not so sure. It's only a classic because it was big and different, but upon multiple revisits, I really don't think it holds up as well against most of the other tunes on the album. But this could be down to the fact that it, it is hyped up as this titan, as well as general overexposure to it, or as I call this phenomenon, the isn't she lovely syndrome. Now, this doesn't make it a bad song, of course it doesn't, and I totally understand why it's a classic in the way that it is, and I understand why so many people are so fond of it. It just means I'm not the biggest fan of it at the end of the day. It's very, very, very good, just not my kind of very, very, very good. Though, in its defence, the real worst thing this song ever did was lend its namesake to the Australian band Jet, whose single, Are You Gonna Be My Girl, will haunt my experiences of the anthem for rowdy uni chavs at two in the morning as far as the eye can see. The next song is one that has always been my father's absolute favourite wing song, and when you consider that it's one of Paul's most touching smaller tracks, it's easy to see why. This is Bluebird. This is the song that I will admit right now, in my younger days, I used to skip over with worrying regularity. That was probably because it's not as catchy as the rest of the album, but what it is, is completely touching. 
This is another one of those McCartney songs where the curtain is pulled back somewhat on the McCartney media train, and we see the vulnerable man that lies beneath the surface charm and smarm. Bluebird is the first song on the album that is a most overt attempt to tap into the true inner feelings Paul has about freedom and escape. And rather than making it into a fun little romp about prison break, he slow things down and takes the time to show the true desperation he feels, both as an artist and as a human being. Obviously, the image of the bird and flying is one that Paul revisits because it's one that is so affecting to him. It's had a particular impact on his soul. He can get up and fly away whenever it wants to, and it isn't tied down to any of our earthly troubles. And in that sense, all Paul's bird songs are sister tracks to each other. Clearly, Paul wishes he could fly away in some respect, but he knows he's tied to this earth. The line, touch your lips with a magic kiss and you'll be a bluebird too, is the part of the song that brings the track back to being a core McCartney song. Clearly, it is Linda, not Paul, who is the bluebird, as she has flown into his life and has given him some semblance of freedom. Once again, the moral of the story is that love is the ultimate freedom. Bluebird is a song about a bluebird as much as Jaws is a movie about a shark. Am I the only one who feels that, that even after six years, this has a sense of too soon syndrome about it after the success of Bluebird? Like, maybe two more albums, Paul, you could have done a, a big bird song like this again. Yeah, we had Single Pigeon on the last album, but we seem to be a bit too bird-centric, mate. There's, a, there's too many avian variety songs, Paul, here, yeah? All right? I always felt that a song like Bluebird may have been better served if it had appeared one or two songs later on the album. Like, to go from the grand theatre of Jet to a very intimate experience was always a little jarring for me. That being said, it is always nice to welcome a change of pace for the album. It is the first song that truly reflects the place in which it was recorded in. Now, besides the besides the wooden percussion and, and maybe something about the chanting, there's no real African influence on the song, but what the song does convey is the sense of those cool, lazy nights on the African beach. It would be impossible to ignore the exotic flavour of the track, as it appropriately transports you to somewhere wholly new and alien, especially for this album, and it counterpoints this by evoking an important sense of home and welcoming. It's laid back, and hushed sounds is one of its greatest strengths and delivers one of the most intimate moments on the album. The acoustic guitar in this song is one of those tracks that everyone on guitar chord based websites seem to flock to as one of those easy go to songs to learn on guitar, though not me of course, I still struggle with, with B bar chords, but I've heard countless guys playing this one. That being said, as we've said before, this is no Blackbird, and it isn't trying to be. There's some subtle picking in the chorus, but overall it reflects the more relaxed and laid back rhythm of the song. The frenetic picking and display in Blackbird, whilst beautiful in its own right, did conjure that sense of like agitation and movement, whilst here things are still and there's a, a sense of freedom. The, the goal of freedom is more tangible and so much more personal that there's no need to throw anything too complex in there. Paul's bass here, like many of his slower numbers, is never going to be the next Hey Bulldog or Rain, but it's suitably soft, melodic, and adds that graceful, slightly thicker edge to the production. Paul's vocal register is some of the softest and most tender he's ever put to record. There is a reason why Paul's vocals are so beloved on this track, and that's just because he nails it, plain and simple. You can so easily understand the emotion he is conveying to the listener. You hear the anguish, the love, the yearning to break free. And then the whole group comes in and does it all as one. Once they start singing I'm a Bluebird, it just it always gives me the shivers. It's some of the best harmonies the band ever did. It's smoothed, understated, and showcases the group doesn't have to be belting out rock tunes in a stadium to sound good singing together. As the song progresses, they get a little more confident, and the vocals become even more complex and layered, though it does not affect the beauty of the track whatsoever. Then, for the last repetition of Bluebird, that final piano coda comes in when the song you know, is like winding down to that close, and it reverberates so effectively when you hear it played with the guitar. It's a lovely little touch, there's no piano on the rest of the song, it's just added in there to create gravitas to end such a brilliant song. This is the first song where we are actually introduced to one of the oft unfairly unsung heroes of Band on the Run, and that is saxophone player Howie Casey. Uh, Luke Perezzi, who I had on a couple of, of episodes ago in his book Paul McCartney Recording Sessions, described the saxophone solo in this song as soft, enchanting, nocturnal. It conveys the brightness of the African night and deserves a special place amongst the best in McCartney's career. And he could not have been more on the nose about that, really. 
I am surprised I didn't do an, an offensive little Italian accent there, go me. But the sax in this is so brief and it's a subtle little addition. Many solos like this tend to overpower the rest of the track and this does the opposite. The song just comes to an almost complete halt to allow this warm solo to worm its way in and then it's complemented by the first rate group harmonies. When Howie Casey was asked about how he wrote this solo he explained Paul said I've got this really nice ballad and I'd like you to play a solo on it. He played the track and I blew a solo, just coasting through it, looking at the chords. When we came to the end he said, that's it, that's fine. I said, hang on Paul, I can do better than that. He said, maybe you can, but that's what I'm after. He let me try it a few more times, but he used the first one, and hearing now, I can see he was right. In terms of when it was written, Bluebird is the oldest song that features on Band on the Run, and was probably written as far back as 1971, when Paul was on vacation with Linda in Jamaica. Very much in the same way he teased My Love before its release uh, during the Wings European tour, this song was also given a bit of free beta runs on the James Paul McCartney TV show, where he actually sang it in a medley with Blackbird. After the fellow ran some Kuti debacle, where Paul was accused of apparently stealing African music, Paul was very cautious about having any African sounds on the, this album, and, you know, whilst it does contain trace amounts of, of Africana, Paul was still very cautious. Paul wanted to be 100% safe on this, as not to offend anyone, to the extent where no Nigerian musicians would be part of the recording sessions, except for Bluebird. As Paul put it, The only other musician on the album, other than the orchestra, is funnily enough, African. We were going to use African musicians, but when we were told we were about to pinch the music, we thought, well, up you. We'll do it ourselves then. There's no question about it. We were back in London working at AIR Studios, and an old friend from the past named Remy Kabaka turns up. And he's from Lagos. He turns on one of the tracks and he played a bit of percussion on Bluebird. So he's the only one who ended up doing anything on the album. It's safe to say that Bluebird was and is a classic in every sense of the word. It is easily one of the more iconic songs off the album, even if it's for a relationship to Blackbird. But despite that, it still retained its own mood and identity. Bluebird is the band at its most serene as it generates this totally calm and beautiful atmosphere without really having to do much at all. On an album so well produced and so obviously produced, Bluebird exists to be the polar opposite and truly be a, a wonderful moment of quiet. When I think about the next song on this album, I think, my god, where was a song like this from the last album? We are at the point of the fourth song by now, and this is really where we need that sense of confidence in an album to start shining through. Because anyone can do three good songs at the start. And this next song fits that tab A into that slot B perfectly. This wild, reckless and thoroughly enjoyable song is going to keep the ship precisely on course the way we want. This is Mrs. Vanderbilt. This song has the best example to date of what happens when Paul truly gets the ingredients balanced right in the right way between his silly songs and his hard rockers. The result of which is a song that which skirts a very wholesome and badass edge but still maintains that silly McCartney whimsy that makes it so irresistible. The song is the injection of fun into the somewhat grand and serious tone that's been on the first three tracks and Mrs. Vanderbilt is a reflection of the best moods of these sessions, showing McCartney focusing on what he does best, inventive sing-along melody. Throughout McCartney's career, there's been one key element to his songwriting, and that is that he specifically likes writing songs with tunes and lyrics for you to sing in and join in with. He likes people to take, to take participation, ever since She Loves You and From Me To You. This song takes all that to the simplest level, with lyrics you literally cannot forget, and and Coast Cross is very contemporary, all things considered. The ritualistic ho, hey ho, appeals to your most base and primitive brain, and you relax perfectly biologically to its primal beat. But what it does for a song is that it welcomes the listener to feel like they are part of a more personable, almost campsite atmosphere with its inclusive group vocals. Guttural, it's raw, and has a simplicity that will always work well for me with Macca's music. And as you've probably guessed, always gets me to bop and jive, and in many embarrassing ways, muttering ho hey ho, going down the street. 
try not to mutter this song while passing any women, you may cause offence. Like I say, this is a very inclusive vocal. Its ease is its charm, and it doesn't expect too much from you to be able to sing along. It's a song that makes you feel like you are part of the gang. The Wings group vocal, as you're probably going to consistently hear me say across this episode, are top-notch for this record. Maybe because there's less moving pieces to work with, or maybe the recording atmosphere was just right, but either way, the way the group sings here is just so on point. Rather like Bluebird, despite doing very little, it just can't help but be ridiculously catchy. This consistently jovial atmosphere within the song reaches critical mass by the end, whereby there's this breakout of raucous and frankly silly laughter that can be heard spilling out from the band members as their chant becomes too much for them. George Harrison ended uh, Within You Without You on Sgt Pepper in a similar way, but rather than counterpointing you know, a very serious philosophical song with laughter, what Paul does here is just reinforce the silliness of the whole affair and let you know not to take anything too seriously. He refers to this... Uh, back with Paul Gamaccini. The laughing, it started out in Africa. We were sort of doing daft laughs at the end. When we got back, we eventually overdubbed this crowd of people who were laughing. It was great, listening to the tapes, trying to select a little bit of laughter that we could use. Most of it was us, but we needed a little bit to, to cushion it up. It was great listening to a room full of people laughing in stereo. They were getting into all these laughing fits, and we were on the floor. The bass, by the way, is so good in this one. It's so good. It's so good. It's everything you would want from a song like this. It's swampy and it's playful and it's grooved to a T. McCartney is a true rhythm master in this one. And you know he'll be listening back to the rhythm of this track with uh, just the guitar and the drums, maybe some vocals, and just having a blast wrapping his way around the bounce of this track. This is also the best wings drumming that Denny Saul never did. They definitely have an African Caribbean feel to them as they do that sugar dugger dugger across the kit. But what I really love is that you feel the movement within your headphones and it just adds this swoosh and rush to the song. We have another guest appearance from Band on the Run standout Howie Casey on the saxophone again and absolutely killing it as usual. He adds such a literal burst of energy to the song that just tips it over the scale from being like lively to balls to the wall ecstasy. Even the acoustic guitar conveys that adventurous campsite feel. I mean, the song is so simple in its chord structure that even I can play it. It's always a little odd to describe a Paul McCartney song as a drinking song, but its chorus has the simple, memorable chorus that, to me, fits comfortably in with the cadence, tone and sounds of a British stadium full of footballers singing along. And McCartney has always been a fan of pub tunes and this, and this kind of thing, as seen from the Paul McCartney special, or the video for Wonderful Christmas Time. I feel like he is appealing to that part of himself that revels in joining in himself on a homely chorus with true sing-along melody. And that in itself makes it an instant classic, at least for me. A funny note, I always wanted to hear a remix of this song with Another Day, and I'm sure I did hear it at some point years ago. I struggled to find one. They just perfectly fit together, wouldn't they? The lyrics to Mrs. Vanderbilt, while seemingly rather innocuous and unfocused, are still comfortably deep within the world of Band on the Run. Right from the get-go, Paul paints what is obviously his wildlife-inspired life, where he's down in the jungle living in a tent. You don't use money, you don't pay rent. This is a very idealistic, borderline, hippy-dippy outlook on the world that is essentially his ultimate realisation of the album's theme of freedom. Those now famous-ish opening lines of the song are actually taken direct from a catchphrase of an English music hall performer named Charlie Chester. Chester's own phrase was, down in the jungle living in a tent, better than a bungalow, no rent, which doesn't nearly roll off the tongue the same way Paul's does, but this is a line obviously that he must have just had in his head ever since he knew he was coming to Africa. Even the line, leave me alone, Mrs. Vanderbilt, is a plea from Paul asking, if not begging, for the establishment to leave him alone and let him be to carry on his life in peace. The reason it's Mrs. Vanderbilt is because of the real life Van Der Bilt family who made a fortune in the 19th century through rails and shipping empires. They thoroughly represent the establishment in this track. The lyrics, however, don't refer much more to them, except in passing. Uh, there is that line, when your pal is on the wane, don't complain of robbery, a reference to the family's kind of financial decline into the, tw into the 20th century. But why that name in particular? McCartney said, Mrs. Vanderbilt was a good one. I didn't know anything about her. I just knew she was like a rich person. The idealistic, easygoing, relaxed lyrics during the middle eighth of the song try to break down what, what the point of this financial world is that we've built around ourselves. Wow, this really is the wildlife of Band on the Run, isn't it? He does start off with, you know, what's the use of worrying? What's the use of hurrying? Two things that kind of typify the modern hustle and bustle lifestyles. But he ends with, what's the use of anything? And in that moment, you are forced to question that notion. What is the point of any of this? 
It could all be seen as a little apathetic even, perhaps. And maybe that's purposefully counterpointed by the cheerful lollop of the song. The song itself was not actually a regular part of McCartney's solo concerts until it topped a 2008 poll on a Ukrainian website asking the fans for requests. It was performed at a free concert in Kiev later that year, where it was introduced by Paul with the words, We were asked to perform this song in Ukrainian. Whilst not being issued as a single in the US, Mrs. Vanderbilt was released as a single across continental Europe, again with Bluebird as the B-side. Mrs. Vanderbilt is always a song that I look forward to whenever I put this album on. The sheer infectious giddiness and joy that gets into my bloodstream whenever I hear that jungle rhythm and ho, hey ho, makes me completely powerless from the get-go. Is it the best song on the album? Not nearly, but it also doesn't exist in the bland context of just being good on the album. I've heard this song come on the radio several times and each time I'm instantly transported back to that tribal campfire like I never left. People, myself included, talk endlessly about atmosphere in songs and usually it's say for uh, intense or overly emotional settings but just simply being able to create a genuinely fun atmosphere is something special in its own right. And a bit of fun is just what was prescribed for McCartney and for the album, especially when gearing up for the next song. Now, the album, to a point so far, has been fairly light-hearted. It's been kick-ass and powerful, but still maintaining that charming McCartney air. The next song is Where Everything Changes. This is a serious rock song, people. And the stark shift in mood reflects this appropriately. This is Let Me Roll It. introduced to this song with a trap. What starts off as a mysteriously atmospheric if unremarkable little rock rock synth intro with funky drums and murky bass acts to lull the listener into a false sense of security. Things slow down, things get quiet and open, you could almost hear the non-existent crowd in the background. They are tense, they are on edge, waiting for something. And why is McCartney lulling us into such a placid state? It's because of the following guitar riff. It's like, hot damn, where did that come from Paul? Like, yeah, we know you ain't no slouch on the guitar, but that was pretty... Uh, it feels heavy, it feels biting, and more importantly, relevant and edgy. Especially for Wings. Paul gives us a peek at what Wings could be, with a down-to-earth, rough-and-ready rocker that, like many of the tracks on this album, just seemingly come out of nowhere. Yeah, like, we know this is Paul McCartney, we know this, but the consistently defining songwriting on the album makes each song, as you go on, feel like part of a greater achievement. It's like... We're five songs in and we're showing no signs of stopping. Then there's the build-up. The drums do that wonderful little bit of smack, 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 smack. It's that basic McCartney no-frills drum style that gives the song some, some punch during these louder moments, but also, because of his attention to melody, allows him to be fully restrained, almost non-existent in the quieter ones. There are these long, teasing pauses between the riffs in the bars of this song. McCartney recognises how awesome the riff is, he knows the feel of the song, and is going to get every penny's worth out of it. The production becomes very sparse, and it becomes deafening between each guitar part, which just adds to the showmanship and expansive scope of the album. It's like a dog's bark of a riff. It makes you stand on edge. It's, it's hard to describe, but, but it's just bewilderingly awesome for a Wings track. You're almost a bit on edge, because there's that feeling in the back of your mind that they might never actually do anything quite this good again. But hey, I'm utterly helpless but to love this one. When talking about writing the riff, Paul McCartney said, A song like Let Me Roll It came about from playing around with the little riff. I'm lucky but the rest of the song just comes to me. This fits in with the idea that the band on the run sessions were very loose yet very charged and motivated at the same time. It has the freedom for Macca to really play around with little guitar riffs, like I'm sure all guitarists do, but it also has the commitment in order to turn it into this mind-blowingly satisfying track. The vocals are also pretty stellar on this one. The group harmony effort on the choruses are some of the best on the album, and again it's another song where Paul dares you not to sing along. It's a simple chorus, but the powerful thrust behind it gives it both poignancy and meaning that other groups just simply wouldn't be able to give it. Now there's a large group of people, a group of whom I was never aware of until doing the research for this song, but there's a general feeling in the, in the community that this track has a definite Lennon vibe to it, and rather like one of those optical illusions, one where you once couldn't see it before, 
Now you can, you can't unsee it, and now I struggle to see this song in any other way, because frankly, it kind of does. There's definitely a bit of evidence for this as well. The riff has these harsh and rough sounds, and it just comes across as something like off the Plastic Ono Band album. You know, overall, the song feels like it's dredging up tones from the depths that Paul McCartney never really explores very often, but Lennon did. Or, you know, perhaps is it just whenever Paul seemed to do something heavier that it's seen as a John influence? Because John was seen to be generally heavier. Is Paul incapable of becoming grittier at this point? Yes, we have My Love and One More Kiss, but this is still the same man, like I say, who gave us Helter Skelter and, and gave us Ram. Are we forgetting that? But the main tell that kind of tipped most people over the, over the edge is Paul's voice. It has a definite Lennon echo to it. Paul himself had to address this issue many times in interviews, and in all of them, he's pretty much against said implications that he sounds anything like John. Back to Gambaccini, Paul said, I still don't think I sound like him, but that's your opinion. I can dig it if it sounds that way to you. In another in interview, he carries on, Let me roll, it was not really a Lennon pastiche, although my use of tape echo did sound more like John than me. But tape echo wasn't John's exclusive territory. And if you have to remember that, despite the myth, there was a lot of commonality between us in the, in the way that we thought and in the way that we worked. I've been going back a lot through John Lennon's discography lately. I know, heresy, right? And surprisingly enough, I've found myself enjoying a lot of the album tracks. Even a whole Yoko song. But it's hard to escape the fact that, that the vocals in these songs do sound a hell of a lot like John's work from the Pasigona band or Imagine, especially songs like Well, Well, Well or I Found Out. But as Paul is about to clarify, and just as Paul clarified, just because one person does something, that, that doesn't ban other bands from doing something similar. When talking about the lyrics, people, you know, since it sounded like John, thought maybe Paul was addressing the song to John. Every single album is going to be, you know, veiled with theories of which song is it is about John Lennon. It's about time we, we got to that one as well. Uh, addressing this in Clash magazine, Paul said, let me roll it. it wasn't to John. It was just a style that we did with the Beatles that John was particularly known for. It was really that use of the echo. It was one of those, you're not going to use echo just because John used it. I don't think so. To tell you the truth, that was more about rolling a joint. There was a double meaning there. Let me roll it to you. That was more at the back of my mind than anything else. And I also thought it was a little bit too long without an overt marijuana reference on this show. The metaphor for all rolling a joint for someone and passing it over in itself has always been a a gesture of peace, a gesture of putting the past behind oneself. And I guess that kind of works, but it doesn't really fit with the sound of the song at all. It's a little bit romantic just for just for passing a joint. Depends on how high you are though, I suppose. The whole track follows a similar vein to songs like My Love and Maybe I'm Amazed, where Paul seems to be frustrated with being unable to fully express himself and fully articulate his love for another. Whether that's Linda or John is up to your interpretation. It's intentionally vague about the specifics of that romance, though. Now, this could be down to a similar McCartney-esque sense of being overwhelmed by the size of the love that he's feeling. He knows that he's been given this love in the in the palm of his hand. It's been offered up, and you know it's in the easiest way possible. Yet, he, despite this, he simply doesn't know how to respond in kind, and would simply wish to allow his heart to do the loving or the rolling, rather than let his brain and his words fail him. His heart is the purest conduit for this love. The image of the heart being like a wheel is a very poignant one for me, because what do wheels do? They roll, and the metaphor is one of extending love to another. So in essence, what Paul is saying is that as wheels are made for rolling, hearts are designed for loving. It's nothing Paul hasn't taught us before, but I just find the imagery to be wholly unique and satisfying in their own way. Maybe that's just a particular image that resonates with me, I don't know. In the sense of entrapment, the song is very fitting with the album's core themes again, rather than any physical imprisonment though, this one is about being trapped within one's own mind and emotions. Let Me Roll It has just the right amount of teeth that the album needed at this point. Its rough iron shod boots are balanced with perfect nuance by McCartney's heartfelt, almost saccharine lyricism. This is the song that adds that credible rock that McCartney was so desperately after into the mix and takes Band on the Run further along its string of knockout genres and vibes. I recently went on Reddit and asked the community whether they detected any major African influences at all on this album and this next song was the song that everyone always pointed to. And it certainly has that air of the hot open savannah about it as well as an undefinable quality where the whole song just feels so slightly alien and alluring in equal measure. 
As we've discussed, McCartney wanted to keep Africa out of the album for many reasons, but this is the one where the climate, I feel, subconsciously worked its way into the beat more than he actually desired. This is Mamunia. Originally, this was the B-side to the Jet single and was ultimately replaced by Let Me Roll It, the last song. Now, I know what you're thinking. It was because Let Me Roll It makes it just a better bedfellow with Jet than this track. And whilst this may be true, the reason it was taken off as a B-side is that it was actually being considered to be released on its own A-side single. Unfortunately, these plans were scrapped at the last minute and, as I've said before, it ended up as the B-side for Mrs. Vanderbilt. This was the first song specifically written to appear on Band on the Run, stemming from the group's last holiday, which was to Marrakesh, where they stayed at the now-famous Mamonia Hotel. There's an extra O in the hotel spelling of the word, that's why I pronounced it slightly differently, and I'm not sure if it's meant to be pronounced differently, but you, you can actually see a snapshot of this hotel and the said holiday uh, inside the inner sleeve of Red Rose Speedway. I'm looking at it right now. And again, you have to reinforce that there's only been 219 days between these past two albums. It was the first to be recorded, which, as Paul recollects, was during a phenomenal tropic rainstorm. So it makes sense that for a song that muses on the ideas of rain not being such a bad thing, it was recorded in such a defiant way against nature like that, as the warm and welcoming environment translated without flaw onto the record. Whilst I can't find any sources that are all too specific about this, the story goes that Paul wrote some of the lyrics after being inspired by a sign he saw hanging in a bar outside in Lagos. If I had to take a guess, it might be the part that goes, so the next time you see rain, it ain't bad. Don't complain, it rains for you and me. Uh, I only suppose this as it seems like it's the perfect sort of contextless, half insightful quote that you may find scrawled on a pub wall or possibly an Instagram post. The lyrics are chiefly concerned with rain in Los Angeles rather than the Merseyside, and even though the song was inspired by visiting Marrakesh in Tunisia, where I'm sure rain actually is never a bad thing in those places, but I love how they just sing about rain being for you and me. It's a a, a wonderful unifying metaphor for life, rebirth and renewal, and once you have broken free from an old life you can't really be the same as you were before lest you end up back there so Paul is seeking rebirth for the band and for his life and in effect this album it really was a rebirth of sorts both for Paul and Wings. The mention of LA rain clouds is another one of those adopted faux Americana references that seem to purvey Paul's work at this point and I'm sure you didn't start listening to this podcast to listen to me bitching about my anglophile itch not being scratched, but it seems to be an all too common thing for Paul at certain points in terms of, you know, what I want from my McCartney album. Yes, I know the American market dwarfs the UK. It's just upsetting for me as a fan that he belongs to the world now, not just this little island that I call home anymore. It has the cutest start to any of the songs on the record. And despite being the song that contains the African flair, it's the smallest on the album. Okay, let's just talk about the African bit first. Um, because we've kind of already stated that there's most certainly an Africana component present hidden within the strands of the structure of this song. The track has an unmistakable ritualistic element to it that's you know mostly due again to a very close-knit, uh, almost private nature that emanates from the recording. You really do feel like you are one of the gang again in this song. You, you can just imagine the tribe has uh, quietened down now for the night and is doing a much more mellow harmonious tune you know rather than ho hey ho we have mamunia mamunia in repetition constantly and you could imagine people dancing into the night around this you've got the very prominent bongo work throughout the song which also has obvious african connotations and actually i'm surprised paul didn't notice that in a more obvious way in the presence of this recording but do i think that this song rips off any of the local african music scene from what i've heard no but is it possible that Paul may have been influenced, again, even subconsciously, in the way that the mood is kind of ultimately formed in this song? Maybe, but it's certainly most not what many people might call like cultural appropriation or anything. Uh, Who's to say the song isn't more influenced by a Moroccan sound than a Nigerian one anyway? 
either way the song certainly benefits from having this different kind of texture to it what it does contain is some of the most utterly superb three-part vocals that wings ever gifted us again the intimate vibe like we're all in one small room or, or cave really helps out as it you feel deep amidst the singing the acoustic guitar which reminds me of some of paul's best picking from like the white album all the way up to mccartney one is marvelously inventive and restrained the lightness of his touch throughout the whole song is a great palate cleanser with him finally kicking the heavier rock sound that has been going into gear across the rest of the album when it comes to paul's slick bass on this one i have to end up using a uh, a phrase that i hate to use but it really is about the notes that he isn't playing and I always hate saying it's not about the notes he isn't playing because I can hear those notes from home. But it really is a bass line that takes a step back and bides its time till the perfect millisecond to dole out that exact little lick. To highlight the lack of musicians or even staff during these sessions, McCartney used one of the roadies to keep rhythm on a bass drum throughout the recording. Though he was apparently uncredited, so fuck him. The lovely Linda's luscious little Moog solo at the end, as the track once again comes to a close, is another one of those elements whereby... If you had to absolutely take a red pen to something in the song, it might be that. But Linda's distinctive little Moog and keyboard sounds, in their charming simplicity, are a key element that makes Wings sound like Wings. And more importantly, Band on the Run sound like Band on the Run. During Linda's little flourish, you can hear Paul say, not so subtly on the mix. He makes a quick comment off mic. He says, everywhere I look, it's the same old sound. I like it. Now, some people call these audio mistakes in the dubbing, but to me, like so many Beatles songs or when he calls uh, My Plug Came Out on Get On The Right Thing, it's one of those great little touches of imperfection that somehow paradoxically make the record perfect. Despite the 4 minute 50 runtime, this song is still rather breezy, and its length is not felt at all. Now, I know some people see this as a bit of a plodder, or maybe even a bit too slow, or a bit too much of a stoner campfire circle anthem, but I personally find its atmosphere, even without the assistance of said substances, is totally enveloping and all-encompassing. Lamunia is very much like Bluebird on this album, in that it's hard not for it to get lost amongst the other enormous rockers on the album. But its charisma comes from the fact that it's a quieter, more self-reflective number, and achieves a true serenity without any studio wizardry, tricks, or any sense that Again, that they were, they, were, they were trying too hard. This is a wonderfully casual album for what it delivers. And it's the epitome of all relaxing McCartney tunes. Up next is a song that really caught me off guard when I went back to this album. And it continues to do so to this day. This is No Words. No burning love, sweet burning love, steep inside. Eagle-eared listeners of this show will no doubt be aware that Denny Lane's absolutely and somewhat unexpectedly soaring rocker and its closing solo acts as the quasi-outro for this show. So it wouldn't be too much of a leap for you out there to guess that I'm rather fond of this track, or that it has at least had some significant effect on me. Out of the whole of Band on the Run, this is the song that I most commonly re-listen to. It never gets boring at all. It never fails, time after time, to take me back to that place of utterly unabashed joy that I first felt when I heard this song. Again, it's probably contextual within my life and where I was at that point, but upon re revisiting, it acted like a real curveball. I remember listening to loads of songs from this album at one point or another throughout the general kind of osmosis of my life, and it was one of the few that I was not aware of until I sat down and listened to the album proper in full from start to finish. Maybe this is why it stands out to me so strongly, but I just remember being sat alone in my bedroom, being utterly blown away by this one. Jesus, I dare say I, I, there was a tear that rolled down my eye when I first heard it. I'm genuinely sat here right now with my, you know, with my proper critic's hat on and resisting to outright declare my unbound affinity for this track and call it my favourite. I kind of feel like I'm already over aching this one a little bit and many of you out there probably feel that maybe this song isn't particularly anything to write home about and I can see why you may think that but this is not just any old Wings album track. I think I've already spoken about elements in music that have resonated with me so much that they must have been specifically designed by the military to be so pinpoint accurate and for me the main guitar melody in this song could be one of those secret black ops moments. 
I cannot fully explain it, but the way the notes are structured, the tempo of which they come out of, the way they are played just tap into my, into my third eye and they affect me in a wholly primal way. I know not the same goes for everyone, but for me this is the best melody on the whole album and I know it's going against the church because Macca didn't write it. One of the real highlights of the phantasmagoria of guitarmanship on this album is the way that McCartney and Lane do a duo and meld into one sublime sound as the song draws to a close. These somewhat dueling, somewhat complimentary solos are just some of the best guitar work on display in the Wings catalogue. I mean, yes, it is a fade out and fade outs are always lame, but once more they're, they're leaving me wanting more. It's like when George Harrison starts his sitar solo on Love To You. You feel like the song's just about to get even better and he cuts it off. It leaves you almost wounded, but you're utterly affected. The orchestral work in the song is suitably melodramatic and whimsically classical. It's present in the song from the get-go, and it adds a certain amount of kind of Hollywood, dare I even say George Martin charm to the whole affair. What is funny is that the, uh, the intimacy between Paul and Denny highlights the fact that there is a noticeable lack of Linda on this song. And I feel that's a good thing, j just for this moment. You know, clearly, yes, Clinda clearly has had her own fair share of close-knit times with Paul so it's nice to see her take a back seat here and let them bond over this one because they really do sound great together though Linda's keyboards do add a chirpy little sound in the background. Paul's little solo vocal in the middle eighth as Denny Lane himself will mention later is so blatantly and painfully Paul McCartney is unreal. What's also unreal are the notes that McCartney is seemingly able to reach when he's singing this. It's one bit that I never bother to sing along with because I'm just not going to do it. Similarly to Mamunia, Two Wings roadies also provided some of the backing vocals throughout this track, but to be honest, Wings use so many double tracks and extra vocal harmonies that are layered that it's hard to tell any voices apart and mix the production. Still, I suppose it's a nice Christmas story for the two roadies at least. I've already spoken in some detail about the strength of the album tracks on this album and No Words is the single perfect example of that. I was not expecting such an affecting and moving track at this point on the album. I mean, by the time we get to its spot, I was seriously expecting some long overdue when the night sloppiness or some or a some people you never know mushiness to swoop in and be this album's c -c -c combo breaker but it never came and in its place we had my favorite band on the run McCartney mini opera extravaganza except it's not McCartney is it we have to acknowledge that above all else the key aspect to no words in in wings history is that it's the first song primarily written and composed by Denny Lane Paul has let Denny truly take the lead, for a whole track no less. Now, we've said before that Paul is notoriously difficult to collaborate with when he doesn't have a true equal with him in the studio. So the fact that Lane has a song on here at all is a considerable shift in the status quo in Wings, and marks a new epoch of potential collaboration. Now you may well say Paul only allowed it on the album because it was the first song that he approved of. But Lane has consistently claimed that Paul has always encouraged him to compose more and more music. Not only to foster Lane's own creativity, but as Lane also said, to take some of the focus off Paul. The fact that Lane would become an ever more prominent voice, literally, for Wings, both live and on vinyl, would show Paul learning to trust his bandmate. And since two-fifths of the band had just upsticked and left, it's not implausible to assume that Paul thought he with more room in the studio, it was now the perfect time to allow Denny to have his moment to shine. It could just equally, however, be a, sub a classic subversive McCartney fuck you to McCullough and Sewell to show them what juicy fruits can be born from real collaboration. At a fantastic gig in Eddie's Attic in 2015, Denny Lane said that this originally had been two songs that he made separately, but Paul, again, true Beals fashion, taught him how to staple them together, and jokes that he was still annoyed that Paul still accredited himself on this song though he does confess that the last verse, as I mentioned, definitely has some Paul in it, as it features a line that Denny said he would never write, and that's the line, I love you. Though a few other sources indicate that Paul probably contrib contributed much of that solo in middle eighth that he also sang as well, as it's not only oh so very McCartney in the lyrics, but it's, it's just composed in the way how Paul tends to write songs. I think if we had to pick one quote that pretty much summed up Denny Lane's songwriting relationship with Sir Paul, it would have to be this one. It's just so hard to keep Paul out of a song. There's not a lot I can say about No Words, except it's my favourite song on the album. Yes, that is all you're going to get as a concluding statement. It's the best song. I love it. The next song, in terms of my own experience, is one that people tend to talk about the least on this album. Does it deserve this? 
Mm, kind of. Again, with Band on the Run, there's nothing close to a bad song on it, but they're all on sliding scales and very good, and some are more very good than others. This is Picasso's last words. It came without a warning But I'll be waiting for you, baby I'll be waiting for you there So drink to me Drink to my health You know I can't drink anymore Drink to me What Picasso's last words ultimately is is a very nice breather and mellowing out of pace as we start to make our way towards the end of the album. To say this song is my least favourite on the album is like saying Death Proof is my least favourite Tarantino movie. Regardless of where it is on the list, it is still part of a collective that still soars above the general zeitgeist. Overall, I think it's a fine piece of work. It's a little overproduced, and it marks the point on the album where Paul cannot help himself but indulge in some lengthy meandering. The story of Picasso's last words is one of those great showbiz tales where everything just seems to fall into the right place at the right time. So it goes that whilst Paul was recording the album off in Lagos, uh, Dustin Hoffman was filming the Steve McQueen film Papillon, which is also a film that I distinctly remember because of one quote where a prison guard or prison officer tells Hoffman's character not to masturbate as it may dehydrate him. It's always kind of traumatised and stuck with me that. So yeah, McCartney and Hoffman were fans of each other's work and had one of those, well, we're both famous, we may as well get together for dinner, dinners. Hoffman asked Paul during this evening whether Paul could write a song about anything, to which Paul proudly stated that he could. In an attempt to test this, Hoffman handed Macker a copy of Times magazine with the article Pablo Picasso's Last Day and Final Journey, which was about Picasso's death and contained the now famous phrase, drink to me, drink to my health, you know I can't drink any more. Paul immediately came up with a melody and started strumming, which startled the young actor who called out to his wife, Annie, Annie, he's doing it, he's writing it, it's coming out. But this was hardly black magic that Paul was working now, was it? I strummed a couple of chords and I knew I couldn't go wrong. The actual writing of this composition of this song was also a kind of writing exercise for Paul on the guitar to some degree. I tried to write a song that I'd only use two fingers. Like I said, nothing particularly complex going on here. It's, the song in itself is one that acts as a great chill-out moment for what has been an already frenetic album. After the complete sky-high no words, it is nice to come down to a much more simpler song following it. Like its namesake, it is a great drinking song on the album. And it's not just because it directly refers to the drinking in the lyrics. It's because what the song does is sound like the band coming to the end of a long night playing in a pub. Things start slowing down, they're getting a little surly and a bit sloppy and everyone's getting a little over-emotional. Like we've said, Paul Note secretly loves to write all these songs that people can chant in pubs when they're sozzled and this definitely exists directly in that world now with that exact sentiment rather than just, say, emulating it or trying to slip it past. You know, we're in the thick of it now. So one of the things people will notice is the song's ability to, to wander. Like, the song constantly goes back and revisits a couple of the previous songs that we've already just heard. We get um, snippets from Jet and Mrs. Vanderbilt. It's kind of like a band on the run, greatest hits mega mi or, or medley, and, you know, it's kind of there to act as a, a bookend to the album, to kind of, you know, reflect on the journey we have made whilst listening to it. What I would say, though, is that if there were, say, more editions, uh, maybe No Words or Let Me Roll It, then this could have been the perfect antithesis to the Red Rose Speedway medley. I don't know, I kind of feel like the idea isn't fleshed out enough, and both bits seem a bit rushed and random. And continuing and, and continuing on with this distinctive inability to stick to the path, the song wanders even further and wider, and has two of these jazzy little French sections, complete with oboe and horns, is, you know, admittedly a charming little digression for the song, but it really doesn't sound anything close to what Wings would do. And I, I guess that's the point, but kind of random, kind of out of nowhere. Talking about the song, Paul said, Just the idea of his different periods. This comes back in. It's all a bit of a muddle. We're just making it up as we went along. We didn't have any big concept of it in mind at all. I just thought, we'll mess it up. We'll keep messing it up until it sounds good. Like Picasso did. With the instinctive knowledge that you got. So that's how that one came out. Now, I do have to say that whilst these are some really inventive little interludes, they do not flow nearly as good as they think they do. When compared to the title track of the album, well, there really just isn't any comparison, is there? This feels too episodic, with little rhyme or reason to connect the separate elements. 
like McConaughey has good uh, good for him. He clearly has a lot of ideas for this song, and that's fantastic. Some bands wait years for even one good idea, but the problem comes from trying to spin too many plates at once. On a positive note, I can say the separate elements individually on their own, just as with all McCartney pastiches, do stand up on their own individual merits. Yes, it's great to sing Jet again and have a bit of hey-ho from Mrs. Vanderbilt, but the collage just seems rather pointless and tacked on. And without them, this song could have just been a a more bare-bones, excellent three-minute track on the album. The song is not the combo breaker by any stretch of the imagination, but it spreads itself too far and thin to have any real lasting effect as a cohesive unit. You may remember several individual parts of it, but overall its lack of musical and narrative direction means it's relegated to the unfortunate pile of it works, but only on the album section in McCartney's history books. Luckily, the fact that it's just pretty good still doesn't affect the whole overall whole album as a whole, though, does it? Oh, have I been too harsh on that one? I don't know. I feel like I have. Um, just reading all all that back, I don't I, I don't dislike it at all. It, you want to be fair to all these songs, but there's just something in the back of my mind that's telling me, yeah, Sam, it's good, but it's just not great. I've never dreaded the song, but I'll never put it on an independent playlist either. Please write to the show if you if you love the song and let me know why it's so good. That's at paulmccartneypod.gmail.com. And finally, we have the song that both I and the album have been working our way up to for the better part of two hours. It all comes down to this. The McCartney Piano Ballad to end all McCartney closing piano ballads. This is 1985. For me, this song is Band on the Run. And I know you shouldn't define an album by just one song, but for the longest time, this song had been one of the main contenders for my favourite McCartney songs of all time. Beatles, solo, in wings, whatever. This song continues and caps off that wonderful bar chart trend of Band on the Run, where you just you couldn't think he could have gotten any better, and he pulls this out of a hat and leaves you breathless and dazed. 1985 has and always will be one of those songs that I can ignorantly rely on for a good listen. If I don't ever feel like challenging myself by listening to some newer or interesting music with the mildest amount of adventurousness, I can whack on this one and have a consistent and dependable experience. And I know this is basically me calling it a guilty pleasure, but the thing is I don't feel about guilty liking it at all, but I just know I've probably listened to this song far too many times, which could have been spent expanding my woefully limited musical knowledge. That's how good this song is for me. Like, to me, this song is as good as anything I'd ram. It has Paul at his most untamed and crazy on this album. It's a song that leaves you with two emotions. Firstly, you're upset that Band on the Run is at an end, but you're excited that it's this song that ends it. It's Paul's thank you for listening to the whole album, and he rewards you by giving you a truly interesting and inventive pop ballad that makes the pain of the album's end fade away. We've spoken before at some length about how Paul writes either really engaging and timeless songs to close his albums, or that he just selects the oddest choices that leave you with a sour taste in the mouth. Thankfully, this is one of the best of the former. It's a song where you feel like Paul is having so much fun delivering such a bombastic and over-the-top grandiose track. Like He knows he does these well, and just to see him go all out is it's fascinating. I mean, Paul still uses this song as a close of his shows. E- you know, Even up to the most recent of tours, its ability to draw things to a natural close has, has not waned at all, really. Very much in the same structure as songs in the McCartney discography, like, like My Love, this is a song of repeated breakdowns and constant crescendos. He knows how to play with our heartstrings here. There are these moments of utter calm and quiet throughout the track, where it's just the band softly harmonising until the song, like clockwork, slowly begins to put itself back together piece by piece, adding in all the familiar elements to the song, working our way back up to the quicker pace and tempo. These crescendos let you know that we're building up for something final, something grand, and the song doesn't disappoint. By the time you would hear the song, you wouldn't even need to check the cover to know that it's the last song, just from the feel of the music. It matches its own expectations in a jolly old fashion by sending off this album with a well-timed and well-thought-out bang. The final orchestral part, after all this tense climbing and and suspenseful build-up, is an overwhelming release right at the end. You feel a sense of accomplishment after all of that, and are literally left exhausted after listening to the song. 
but it's well worth it. It's just such a satisfying way to end an album that it's difficult to put into words. So let's discuss the melody. It's up there with the best Macca ragtime ditty licks like Lady Madonna or Martha My Dear, whereby he taps into that part of the brain that showcases his innate gift for creating a sequence of sounds in a particular time signature that intuitively pleases the human ear. This, my friends, is a fucking melody. Not only is it vibrant and energised, whereby you can sense a certain amount of bouncing fun, but it's also steeped in this weighty nobility and earnest authority, whereby you know that this is no throwaway track either. The vocal melody, equally so, is both catchy and memorable. Like a lot of Paul's work around this time, it isn't necessarily the most complicated of tunes, but it complements the piano so brilliantly. It would not be uncommon, I assume, for many people to deduce, much as I did, that this song's roots were supposedly made in reference and reverence to George Orwell's seminal dystopian novel 1984, which my girlfriend is actually teaching at school as we speak. This conclusion was reinforced with the opening line, No one ever left alive in 1985 would ever do, which hints at our hero with, you know, within the song, being dissatisfied with anyone who survives the events of the novel 1984, which, spoiler alert, does not end well for our anti-hero or his lover. Lovers. The novel itself is one of ultimate imprisonment, the imprisonment within one's own self, and the policing of thought crime and individuality. Two things, like we said, that seem more than appropriate for this album, especially with Big Brother confiscating all of Paul's weed and threatening to lock him up at every turn for it. And I wish all of that was true. Uh, I mean, that was some that was some A-grade analysis from me there. And some of it may very well be, but it all seems to be just another part of my own deification of Paul McCartney and his writings. Because on the subject of this song, Paul said, With a lot of songs, it's the first line, and it's all the first line. You just have to go on and write the second line. With a little Eleanor Rigby, I had, Picks up the rice in the church where a wedding has been. That was the first big line that started me off. With this one, it was, No one ever left alive in 1985. That's what I had of the song for months. No one ever left alive in 1986. It wouldn't have worked. So there you have it, folks. It just seems to be completely written... It just seems to be another competently written and catchy love song from Paul. It seems to be much more about what you bring to the lyrics than the lyrics having any inherent meaning. It is, again with many of his songs, the fact that he has always been a melodist before being a songwriter. Because with Paul, things got to rhyme. The rest of the song is pretty vague about who or what he's singing about, I mean. It's about love and the rejection of other people's love for your one true partner. But that kind of itself is a very mature theme for Paul, who was once described as a 60s northern chauvinist. Though the real power of the track is more in the way he sings it. Very much like Maybe I'm Amazed or My Love, which I've referenced like three times on this podcast now. It's, it's the raw force of nature that is his voice that sends it off. Paul has always had such a versatile voice, which has been evident across his albums, and uh, which has been evident across even this album, and I'm glad he gives us something a little bit different for the closer. Now, whilst he's a little crazier on this track than the rest of the album, he definitely isn't doing his trademark young, wild, little Richard impression. What we do get is a voice that is a little gruffer here. It has a bit of character and a, a bit of scale. He does it with real passion. You can really feel the emotions just pouring out of him when he sings it, with no half measures to be seen. He can be seen to barely be containing himself for this last one, like he cannot stand to be constrained even on an album, and is sticking to the album's themes of breaking free of his restraints by, by having a little fun as we say bye. The song after reaching its over-the-top orchestral crescendo ends with a tiny reprise to the title track as it trickles off into the distance. It's a cool little callback that, again, reminds you of that journey, and once more creates a cute little bookend for the listener. There's another nice one of these little bookends with the use of the word mama, uh, which was used in the opening title track. It does create a subtle, maybe even unintentional bridge for the emotional journey of the album. You know, things rhyme, patterns, it's all very nice, if at all real. My favourite version of this song, however, is not the one that was released on the album. When my good friend Tom, my uh, old co-host of Down in the Hole, he's also the host of Battle Rap Resume now, will be joining us for Wings Over America and McCartney too, but he put music on my iPod for the first time. It was kind of a very subtle, sensual moment, but uh, he put Band on the Run on my iPod Nano years ago. Yes, iPod Nano, that's how old this was, folks. And when he put the song on there, it sounded very different than the one most people know, and I got a bit disappointed when I finally put the vinyl of this on, and it wasn't that version. In 1973, after the disastrous Paul Mac James Paul McCartney special, there was another Wings feature called One Hand Clapping, but this time it was more of a documentary with the camera simply watching the group kind of practice and jam, and one of the songs that was showcased was 1985, and features just for the first two minutes or so Paul on the piano at the studio. 
before the backing track eventually joins in for a kind of climactic, bombastic end. And the performance is just completely electric, isn't it? The melody somehow gains extra footing with an even more jazzy and up-tempo delivery, and Paul's vocals are buzzing with his signature showmanship holler. Though the standout element of the song is added sense of gravitas to the first segment, like the lack of drum or Linda's plinky plonky keyboards, it creates such a more astute and shrewd little performance where the emotional resonance of the track seems to shine through all the clearer with the space to work in. Also, the lack of guitar throughout most of the track means that when the solo and the guitar finally does come in at the end, uh, and as, I'm, as far as I'm aware, it is a slightly different solo, it does feel all the more epic at the end, which just further goes to, to show you, which further goes to show you how powerful it is as a closing number. 1985 is, well, at one point it was everything to me in regards to this album. Now I'm a little older and a little more experienced with it, I can see that it's not just this standout track, but the crucial piece in a complex jigsaw puzzle. Band on the Run would not have the lasting impact it has on its audiences if it didn't have this track. I will go on record by saying that this is by far the finest way McCartney's ever ended an album. The grand scale and epic vaulting ambition on display in this song shows us the Paul McCartney we fell in love with the Beatles as he puts his talents not just into making timeless music but also being aware of the audience by putting on a bloody good show and this is the best way to do it with a bang and with and with flair. The overall point of this song is very much the mantra of the album and with Paul McCartney as, as a songwriter that no matter how bad things get, no matter how trapped or policed you are, that love is the key to your happiness, and more importantly, your freedom. So that was Band on the Run, people. Uh, basically, this album would be the album that would carry Wings as a band for years to come. Paul is never going to be able to put out an album or a couple of singles with this kind of treasure trove quality again. Especially in, in terms of what he'll use in, in later years, Band on the Run and Beatles stuff will kind of always make up the majority of a Paul McCartney live gig, and then he'll, the rest of it will just kind of be kind of singles and maybe the odd obscure album track, but this is go-to Paul McCartney stuff, and it's famous for a reason. Is it the classic that everyone makes it out to be? The short answer is yes. Uh, the long answer is yes, it really is. Again, do we feel so positively about it because the last two were so bad? Who knows? I've gone back and I've kind of showed that the first two albums weren't as bad as people once first thought, but they still pale in comparison to this. Is it the best McCartney album? No. It seemed like people didn't and still don't quite get Ram or its importance. Um, I'm not going to sit here on the Band on the Run episode and talk about Ram forever, but I do feel like Ram connects with me as a listener much more. But it's just staggering how consistently good the whole of Band on the Run is. There's not a dud song in the usual sense, and it's just somehow magically gels and meshes together to create both a very inventive yet cohesive sound that was lacking on all the Wings recordings prior to this. And it's just a shame that he'll never be able to keep this up forever. Though what I will say is the next episode, uh, been doing a bit of research for, Venus and Mars, is nowhere near as bad as I thought. But could anything follow this album? Could anything follow Band on the Run? Did Paul kind of blow his load a bit too early? Or was he only truly capable of making an album this good on his own once? If so, it's still kind of worth it. Before I go into the final admin, I'm just going to start our cannon fodder segment here on Paul or Nothing. Uh, on my last show, Down in the Hole, we did a favourite and least favourite song every episode, which is kind of a little trite for this show, as I will have kind of let you know what my favourite and least favourite song is much earlier on than this. So this exercise is to collate not only what is the best Paul McCartney music, but what people should actually listen to on their own if they want a brief history. Uh, I'm going to throw in Band on the Run first. Well, of, you know, of course the song with Sailor Sam was going to get picked for this. It's a McCartney collage to rival Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey, and it continues to show off his excellent ability to arrange a song and use his studio magic to bring it all together. It's shockingly cohesive, that's all I'll say. And I still cannot stress how much the second act of the song still gets me pumped up. The next song will be no surprise to anyone. It's an absolute classic in my eyes. It's woefully under underrated by most critics and fans alike. I'm going to throw in no words. It's easily the most significant song on the album in the Wings kind of quote unquote history and as far as songwriting skill. And it also has the best guitar solo on the album as well. And some of the most inventive melody. It's, it's just got it all. And to top it off, this was the song that sealed Paul and Denny's songwriting partnership. It's the song that, it's, the, it's, it's just another one of those songs that kind of scored my life at one point or another. And last but by certainly no means least, we're going to take 1985. This has to be preserved forever in one of those bunkers where they keep examples of bacteria and 
animal DNA and movies. This song needs to be preserved forever. It's an absolute unabashed classic. Its power to get me involved every time and get invested is almost unparalleled in other music, and I don't know a song that can ever get me riled up the same way this one can as consistently. It's just borderline perfect. And that was Cannon Fodder. I'm going to do a small playlist now and put that on Spotify. I'm not sure how many people out there are on Spotify, but it'll be a public playlist where I'll be collecting all of the Cannon Fodder, putting that all into one playlist, and eventually we'll have like a little visual guide to Cannon Fodder, and we'll now know what the Cannon of McCartney is. In one place, you can listen to everything I've recommended from episode one onwards. Our tastes won't clash too much. But yeah, you'll be able to find that on Spotify just under Paul or Nothing playlist. Like I said, a little bit of admin before we go. Please write into the show whether you agree or disagree with anything I've said. If you think there's something I didn't quite cover, whether you want to share your history of Paul McCartney with me, whether you play an instrument, have you seen him live? Have you seen any of the other peripheral characters in his life? Are you are you Howie Casey? Are you Howie Casey's saxophone? Or as always, if you just want to tell me that I'm awesome and that I do an awesome podcast, please contact us at paulmccartneypod at gmail.com. Subscribe to us on Twitter. Give us a like, a retweet. We are at Paul McCartney Pod. That's at McCartney Pod. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel by now and you, and you haven't looked up either Paul or Nothing or Paul McCartney Podcast, do so now. We need the support. Please leave a like and a, and a comment. Let me know what you think. But if all of that bores you and you're not part of the social media world, you must be in some way connected to iTunes in some way. The best way, and I can't stress the importance of this enough, if you really, really want to help out the show and you want to help me out, you want to keep this going, give me an iTunes review. Uh, I'm not going to say, please give me five stars. I'll leave that up to you, but the certain algorithms are the best way to give the show the little boost it needs. And like last time, last but not least, the blog's been up for a couple of weeks now. Uh, I'd like you all to check out the blog. It's still kind of bare bones. Uh, I haven't done everything I wanted to do with it yet. Uh, I'm looking at some new designs to make it a bit, a bit more jazzier. A few articles are starting to form. Don't panic about that. But the blog is there now. That's www.paulmccartney.wordpress.com and that's where you can get all the episodes in one place, all the articles I'm going to put out. Basically, it's the one place to get the whole of the show. Like all the expansion packs, all the all the DLC will all be there for free on that one website. That's www.paulmccartneypod.wordpress.com. That's the big episode out of the way now, folks. Band on the run. Um, the sad part of this album is that I don't think I'm ever going to like anything as much as this album again. Uh, it's actually been too hard writing about all the songs for this episode. I've written far much more than I normally would. A lot of these songs go way back with me, and it's probably going to come out over two hours, maybe. 2 hours 30, who knows? Thank you for all of your support once again. Please keep writing in, folks. I love reading out correspondence on this show. I like that sense of community, and I like the fact that it's growing. Please tell all of, all of your friends about this show. But I can't wait to see you next time when we're going to do Venus and Mars. I'm going to love you and leave you. Thank you for listening, folks. The outro music's probably playing right as I speak, but all I can say is love you all and take care. See you next time.